it's Papa. I just finished reading about the Mittens, a time when I walked to Sophia's house to ask her a question about Moosehide. I'd like to begin to read today a chapter in One Man's Mile called A History Lesson. It's about Gilbert and some visitors to Moose Factory Island. He was old and stubborn when I met him. After two heart attacks and a stroke, he summarily ignored advice like, Gilbert, it's time to slow down. Realistic about his health, Gilbert pressed on with life. His face had a thin, paunchy look, accentuated by erratically placed teeth. Old battered glasses formed a platform for long wisps of thinning white hair in varying degrees of genuflection to all points of the compass. Red patches of broken blood vessels on nose and cheeks decorated his aging weathered skin, testifying to a relationship with whiskey. Gilbert was a hunter, a reader, and above all else, a talker, making it his business to know a little bit about everything. He always claimed to have a doctorate in life, discussing any subject with an air of certainty, imparting enough information as to seem knowledgeable. Wily and wise, he cautiously avoided depth in conversations for fear of drowning. Awards and interviews flowed to Gilbert because of his willingness to share on any subject. Poised on the edge of two cultures in an age of bridge building, Gilbert found himself in great demand with anyone remotely interested in Native Americans. Traveling the country as an expert on this or that, he learned more to support future travels so he could vote here or advise there. Gilbert was superficial, not insincere. He would speak from his heart, somehow relating every subject to his Cree heritage. He offered listeners a glimpse of Cree life and culture previously seen only by academics of the anthropological persuasion. The world outside his life and village was his foil, a background upon which to paint a picture of his beloved Crees. Instinctively, Gilbert knew that listeners would interact best with what related to their own the norm, their standards, their experience. And so he learned from the world exactly what he needed to help the world learn from him. Gilbert was willing to speak anywhere, political rallies, church gatherings, educational forums, and interest clubs alike. Whether or not his endless supply of anecdotal material, exactly appropriate for every nuance of every subject, was fact or fiction never seemed an issue. Every example, every situation generously seasoning Gilbert's talks had the ring of experience. Each story, each glimpse of Cree life shed a beam of light on a point of intersection, a point of potential understanding between two cultures. People left Gilbert's presentations pleased to know a bit more about his culture and astonished at new sights, insights into their own. Gilbert received not only invitations to events all over the country, but phone calls and visits from organizations from around the world. Some wanted advice for a project. Others hoped to find precedence for a cause. Still others simply wanted to learn more about some aspect of Cree life and history. Gilbert obliged them all. Cree history is intertwined with the fur trade. Fur built the retail supply lines from England and Europe through Northern Canada fostering early missionary efforts in North America. Much study surrounded trade and church as they affected Cree life in the inhospitable North. Gilbert was a living encyclopedia on this subject. Moose Factory Island at the southern tip of the James Bay in Northern Ontario was the perfect place for research. Accessible by train for modern day explorers, it was an early center for European trade and church in North America. Historically, goods were offloaded at the Hudson Bay docks and shipped all over North America. Dog team in the winter and schooner in the summer carried the necessities of life over the James and Hudson's Bay. For the 18th century explorer, faraway places meant wealth and new lands to colonize. For the 20th century explorer, any town inaccessible by road was exotic and interesting. 
Gilbert understood this, becoming a teller of tales, skillfully weaving threads of the past onto the warp of modern life, creating a colorful fabric in great demand. One group of historical anthropologists came to Moose Factory Island, intent on picking up the trail of Henry Hudson and his men along the shores of the bay bearing his name. Early Hudson's Bay Company reports of fair-haired, fair-skinned native children drew small groups of scholars from the safety of the University of Toronto. Armed with bits of ambiguous puzzle about the castaways, this native research team hoped Gilbert would fit the pieces together. Two men and a woman, all scholars, all thrilled to be in the field, stopped by Gilbert's home on the edge of Moose Factory Reserve to interview the native historian. Now, Moose Factory had three distinct residential sections. The southern end was for Southerners, staff for the regional hospital, government workers, and school personnel, all from parts elsewhere, were provided housing on this part of the island. In the center of the island, the non-status native people had built houses. They were primarily descendants of Hudson's Bay staff or natives from other villages who had relocated to Moose Factory. A small Hudson's Bay enclave had occupied a place on this part of the island for more than a hundred years. As well, the Anglican church and residence were built here, testament to the link between commerce and prayer. The third section of the island was reserved for members of the Moose Factory Band. Although no physical demarcations existed, the three divisions were obvious to every resident. That's a little bit of introduction to a history lesson and to Gilbert and to the people that came up to talk with him. I hope you're enjoying it. Have a great day and love one another. Thank you.